Welcome, everyone. As you know, I'm Bill Groves, Chancellor of Antioch University. Um, I'm honored to welcome our panelists tonight, uh, Clarissa Martinez de Castro and Monica Lozano, and our audience. So thank you for attending today's Antioch Works for Democracy, a webinar presentation and conversation entitled Election 2024 and Latino Voters, Issues, Trends, and Concerns. Latino voters could play a very decisive role in the November's election, both at the national state level, even at the local level. So this discussion could not be more timely or important as we try to understand the most pressing issues and trend lines in this diverse community. As many of you know, Antioch Works for Democracy is a multi-month, multi-pronged campaign of education and action to strengthen our democracy and engage with our communities across the country. So thank you for participating in this important keynote presentation and any of the other presentations that we have scheduled for Antioch Works for Democracy, uh, including the Days of Actions. So um, let me introduce our two amazing presenters and facilitators today. First, I'll start with Clarissa Martinez de Castro. Um, she is Vice President of Latino Voter Initiatives of UNIDOS, uh, the nation's largest Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization. She has extensive experience overseeing and developing polling projects on Latino voters and on issues impacting Hispanics. She's a frequent media commentator on the Latino electorate and immigration issues. Clarissa is a graduate of Occidental College and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. So welcome, Clarissa. Uh, secondly, we have Monica Lozano, who was most recently president of the College Futures Foundation, a California-based effort to advance learner-centered innovation that envisions a future where education fosters racial, social, and economic equity. Prior to that, M Monica was the publisher and editor and CEO of La Opinio, which is the largest Spanish language daily in the country. Among her many other accomplishments, Monica was a member of President Obama's Economic Recovery Board and has served on the board of the National Council of La Raza, was a member of the Board of Regents of University of California and of the University of Southern California. She has also served as a member of the Inter-American Dialogue, a US-based think tank that engages a network of leaders to foster democratic governance and social equity in Latin America. So welcome, Monica. Um, I also need to add something special about Monica. She is the mother of an Antiochian and her daughter graduated from Antioch University in Santa Barbara. Um, so we can't be happier about that. Um, the format for tonight is rather informal. We'll begin with an overview presentation of Latino voter issues by Clarissa and then a conversation facilitated by Monica. Um, at the end, we hope to leave about 15 minutes for questions. So feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. Lorian's going to field those questions and feed them to the speakers at the conclusion. So we'll address as many of those as possible. All right, so with that, I'm honored to hand this over to Monica Lozano to get us started. Thank you, Bill and uh, Chancellor Groves. It's it's really a pleasure to be here and for me to be with Clarissa, who I have known for many, many years. And um, as you said, we will have an informal conversation um, following her presentation. But I also wanted to thank um, Antioch for putting together this series. Um, I love how you described it as education and action. Um, the, the idea of working for democracy we don't take it for granted. It is a work in progress. It's something that each of us can contribute to. And I just wanted to mention that Clarissa's work at Unidos US, is, as you heard, I was on the board of National Council of La Jassa, which um, is the predecessor name to Unidos US. Worked with Clarissa. She is clearly one of the leading experts in um, democratic movements, in civic engagement, not just around the Latino electorate, the building multiracial coalitions and how do we come together to advance a vision for this country that is one that is inclusive, representative, and seeks to address the issues that we all care about and 
certainly are at the core of Antioch's values. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Clarissa. She's got, as you can see, a PowerPoint. Um, we'll go through her slides and then um, we'll take that down and have a conversation, take your questions towards the end. And I should also um, thank Lori and Alexander for putting this together, your former provost and now the, the director of, of this really marvelous initiative. So thank you all. And we'll see you in just a minute after Clarissa um, finishes her presentation. Thank you, Monica, and uh, thank you to Antioch as well for hosting this series, and I am humbled to be here. And also after that introduction by Monica Lozano, somebody who I've known for a long time and whose work I deeply respect and admire, mm -hmm. I think I can just ho go home a happy camper now, <laughs> but I'll stick around for the for the slides and the conversation. So I'm gonna to try to go through these slides fairly quickly because uh, that way Monica and I can, uh, you know, Monica has some questions. I have some questions for her, but we also wanna hear from you. Um, and uh, I know Harold is gonna help me with this slide. So if we can go to the first slide, Harold, that'd be great. It's just um, a little bit about who Unidos US is, formerly National Council of La Raza. <clears throat> and one of the things we try to do, I like to say that we work through three P's, policy, programs, and of course, people. And that's kind of the perspective that we bring to the work we do, and certainly to the work we do with the Latino Vote Initiative, which is to look at what policy needs there are to make sure that the path to the voting booth is unimpeded and to bring that into how we look at programs to increase Latino participation. One of the things that's interesting about the Latino vote, uh, and you'll see some of that in the other slides, but is that I'm sure many of you have heard that Latinos don't vote or they're not interested in elections. Uh, some even go as far as saying they don't have a culture of, of democracy or participation. Well, here's the interesting thing. That's one of the reasons I like to throw these stuff, this slide out there because people have heard that so much. But the reality is that more than 80% of Latinos who are registered vote in a presidential election. Um, you are all students of the electorate, so you know that midterms and presidentials participation patterns are different. We're in a presidential, so we're going to talk about presidential years. One of the things that are is clear at the moment is that Hispanics are now the second largest voting age population in the US. I remember when we started doing work about this electorate, there was very little, if any, polling about these voters. I think the first report I did for Unidos back then in CLR was like in 2002, which I know sounds like eons for a lot of folks. It's not that long ago. And we could, pretty much capture polls about Latinos in a couple of pages. Th things have changed. And so one of the things that is notable is that even though they're the second largest voting age population, there's still a lot of misconceptions and mistaken assumptions about this electorate. And unfortunately, some of those also inform or misinform the type of outreach that is done with these voters. And that's one of the reasons we like to really call attention to the fact that where the biggest opportunity gap is in terms of growing the Latino electorate to make sure that they have accurate representation at the polls is closing the voter registration gap, of which right now we have about 13 million who are eligible and not yet registered. The other point that if I leave you with two points, I think that would be one of them. More than 80% of Latinos who are registered vote in presidentials. The other one is that eight in 10 Hispanics in the United States are United States citizens. The reason that is a critical point is because I think that there is a perception out there that the majority of Latinos are immigrants and undocumented. And the reality is the other way around. Eight out of 10 are United States citizens, and of the remaining two, one is a legal permanent resident, and number 10 is an undocumented immigrant. It's still a significant number, and immigration is very close to our hearts and minds, but that is a very different thing. 
The other reason I wanted to emphasize that point is folks might have seen over the weekend and in the last few months gaining intensity this falsehood that is being spread about non-citizen voting. And the pernicious effect of that false narrative also is not only in a way to try to undermine trust in elections and, the, and to lay some groundwork to challenge those for whoever doesn't like the outcome, but also to create an environment that can lead to the intimidation of Latino voters. Why is that? Because the narrative goes that people who are coming into the southern border are being brought in so they can vote and affect the outcome of our, ele of our election, something that is completely false. They also use the fact that, in, you know, put the picture of people who are coming in are Latino. Therefore, if you go to vote on election day and you see a Latino voter, there's your proof, a Latino voting, there's your proof of that false narrative. And that's why it's important to remind people that actually eight in 10 Hispanics in our country are United States citizens and they have a legitimate right to be in that polling location. And so with that in mind, given the growth of this population, we already know that Latinos are gonna play a decisive role. And I believe that Lorian had circulated with some of you, a I call it a primer on Latino voters, but it's something that shows very clearly the statistics, even in states that people don't associate with Latinos, right? Like. Wisconsin or Georgia. And the reality is that in an environment of razor thin margins, Latinos in all of those states have had a share of the vote that is higher than the margin of victory, which really puts an exclamation point on the need for parties and candidates to be reaching out to these voters, something that continues to be anemic, uh, although we are seeing some hopeful signs of improvement on that note. Um, and we'll put a couple of links in the chat for the, some of you who may not have them yet so that you can see where we can have, um, where, where, where you can see some of those statistics as well as the districts more at the congressional level where Latinos will make a difference. And so when we think about 2024, it is anticipated, uh, as you can see there, right, 17 and a half million Latinos will cast a ballot. Now, Latinos are a young population, so are so is our electorate. And so every election cycle, there's going to be a portion of Latinos who are voting for the first time. And so, again, if I sound like a broken record, I think that this puts an exclamation point for candidates and parties that they should be reaching out and engaging these voters because a significant number of them have not heard from any of them before because they are new to the electorate, right? And I think that one of the very interesting ones is that fully, nearly 40% are new since the matchup between Trump and Clinton. The other thing that you probably have heard a bit about is about, I don't know, some people call it the Latino shift, the Latino tsunami, um, you know, in terms of the, of changes in party support. And one of the things we, and then that you also probably heard that this is about Latino men, uh, probably older men, uh, people ascribe other adjectives to that, right? Here's the interesting thing. First of all, when you hear of a shift, I think it's too early to talk about a shift. I call it churning that there, there is definite churning in the Latino electorate. Not surprising given the amount of voters who are new and continuous low on engagement. The other thing we see is that some of this churn is also more deeply being felt among newer voters. And so the, 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 the thing that probably people or some reporters got wrong over, or, or overestimated in the last two cycles when people were talking about a massive shift from Latinos to the Republican side is that 
first of all, where we are right now is that most of those folks are, are more in the undecided or independent than necessarily going to the Republican side. So there's opportunity for both parties there. The other thing is that a lot of times I think people gauge the levels of Latino support based on their understanding or knowledge about the levels of Black voter support for one party or the other. But Latinos have had a different trajectory. So historically speaking, about 30% of Latino electoral support has gone to the Republican column, about two third, one third Republican, two third support to the Democratic side. In the last decade, we saw Republicans some, lose some of that ground, which Democrats were picking up. And in the last couple of cycles, we've seen Republicans regain some of the, of the ground they had lost because Democrats hadn't solidified that to their side. And so right now you see the churn. I think Democrats are feeling that churn because they have experienced erosion, but that's not going completely to the Republican side. Of course, people are going to have to make an, a decision come election day, and we'll see where that lands. And then um, the other thing is that priorities, a lot of times, this is another area where there's at times misconceptions about where Latino voters may be. For a very long time, candidates, parties, if they actually reached out to Latinos, they used to think that the only, re the only issue they needed to talk about was immigration, which was wrong. Now, when they don't see immigration in the top one and the top three and the top five, they go completely the opposite and say immigration doesn't matter to Latinos, which is also wrong. And you've probably been hearing a lot about what's happening to Latinos on this issue. Anyway, so we decided to do a little um, chart that allows you to see what the issues has been. One thing is clear that economic issues have always been top of mind for this community. Again, not surprising given that the majority of the Latino population is in is among working families. So very sensitive to price, cost of living, jobs and wages. And right now, the cost of housing, which is a huge issue for Latinos. And then um, I think that this, I, I understand you're going to get a, a, a copy of this, or so you don't need to worry about this right now. But in case that there are tools or that you want to share with other folks, whether Latino or not, right? We are right now in the get ready part. I, I call it the get ready, get set, go vote. We are in the get ready part where everybody who's eligible or not registered should do so. Importantly, people who are registered should check the status of their voter registration. Why? Because in many states we see, um, what would be the diplomatic word? Uh, overreaching, purging of voter rolls. That has had an impact on many eligible Latino voters. And so sometimes people think that they're already registered and they might have gotten purged. So that's why it's important for people to do that. That's the get the get ready part. The get set is for people to make their plan, whether it is by mail, early, or in person on election day. And then also a part of that is just becoming more aware about mis and disinformation, which is a big, uh, of which Latinos have been a big target. And last but, last but not least, next slide, uh, since we are talking to an, an academic community, uh, knowledge and action, there's also tools um, for voters next in, in, in about these voters. So with that in mind, we put together the Hispanic Electorate Data Hub where you can very quickly see what is the voter registration opportunity gap in your particular state. And uh, by next week, you'll be able to see that down to the congressional district level. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, Harold, you can take down the... Uh, you can take down the slides. We had a live slide at the end, but you guys can walk through the hub on your own. Thank you, Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much and, and for sharing the slides and for making them available. I'm really struck by the, the first point. You said there are, there's a couple of takeaways. One is that eight out of 10 
um, registered voters actually vote. And you gave us a lot of information about misconceptions, the ways in which parties don't outreach. We're going to come back to that. But given the fact that we do have these high participation rates among those who are eligible, what is the primary motivation? What, what is it that motivates Latinos to get out to the polls? And what have you found to be the most persuasive in terms of voter, voter engagement? For voters who actually have gone out to the polls, there has been a number of years where the plurality of those voters saying that it was more to stand up and represent their community than for the actual candidate that they might have voted for. Um, so community weighs in very strongly. And similarly, when we ask voters who are not voters, people who are eligible but are unregistered, many also cite community, right? Things that are going to protect my community or to vote against threats against the community. And of course, women, um, protecting women is also another thing that is emerging very strongly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's come back to that when we talk about the issues. But what you said about community, I find really fascinating because there's this notion that um, party affiliation is sort of lifelong and, you know, life strong. And that's not necessarily the case. It kind of goes to the point that you were saying. A, a lot of people in the past have talked about the Latino voters up for grads. And, and I'd love to hear what you think about that. Basically, it says, speak to me about the issues that I care about. And it's less about just being firmly in the Democratic or the Republican side, but Latino voters are looking for people that speak to them, speak to them about the issues they care about. Those are reflected in their policies, as you said. And then um, it, it, it turns out that on election day, they're making an informed decision based on not just the candidate and the party, but about what they expect that individual to do in terms of their governing. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, one of the reasons, one thing that keeps me hopeful, uh, particularly in terms of what Latinos as an electorate can bring into the equation, right, is that the polling shows that generally they tend to reject extremes and so I think that they could be a stabilizing force, particularly if we try to prevent certain things that are happening. There is no surprise that Latinos are being targeted with so much mis and disinformation to try to push people to extremes or to get them not to come out and vote, right? But uh, on on that notion, we, you know, that's one area both of uh, also of misconception. I'll give you the example of abortion, where because Latinos are a community that is faith and family oriented, I think that people have assumed that they're against, uh, that they're opposed to abortion. And when the Supreme Court decision first came out, I often heard that when I talked to reporters, why are Latinos opposed to abortion? Well, what the data actually shows and what actually matters for public policy, I would say, is that Latinos say, regardless of my own personal beliefs, I don't think that abortion should be illegal or that that decision should be taken away from others. That was more than 70% of Latino voters, including this an equal number of Latino Catholic voters and more than 60% of Latino non-Catholic Christian voters, right? So again, that, that also, another thing that's interesting and relates to that is that a larger number of Latinos identify as conservative than as progressive. But you look at their voting patterns and where they see their values align, and they, they I'm not ascribing this, uh, you can see that from the polling data, they think their values align more with the, the stated democratic positions. But for mm. folks who just want to do an either or box or like something very neat, that can get very confusing. And that's why I think people often get these voters wrong. Well, I'm curious what you just said about um, abortion. And, and I know that on the issue slide that you brought up, re reproductive rights is one of the top issues of, of, of importance um, to Latino voters. 
And I'm wondering if that's also a reflection of the fact that more women, Latina women, are voting than men. And that's one of the trends that we've seen like on, on the engagement scale. It tends to be more women. Is that, if, if, am I getting that right? But I do believe that there's more Latinas who are voting. And I wonder if there's a, a gender difference there as well. It is true that more Latinas vote uh, than Latino men. The, the the difference is not a radical difference, but definitely Latinas have the edge there. The other thing that's interesting is that actually Latino men also share that perspective on abortion that I just mentioned. Latinas are higher by, and, and the reason I don't have it top of mind is because we are about to release a, a, a very large poll of Latino voters next week, 3,000 respondents. And I think that there might be a five point difference between Latino men and Latino women on this issue of abortion, but it's 5% like between 69 and 75, you know, so Latino men are up there on the issue as well. High, high on that, high on the import scale. And I remember when we were doing polling at La Pinon and in, in some of our media properties, um, there was a notion among Latinos that we've actually recognized the important role that government plays in providing basic services, housing, transportation, et cetera. And, um, and yet government shouldn't get involved in personal decisions. That's what I'm hearing you say um, that, that belong to the family and to the individuals. I want to go to the issue that you also mentioned about um, the, the youthfulness of the, our voting um, electorate and the fact that I, I saw it on your slide, a million, this is hard to believe. I actually heard this data point um, during one of the conventions. I think it's like every 30 seconds, a Latino turns 18, which makes them voting age eligible. Um, and so if they're first time voters, and and you know we're talking to Antioch here, um, younger individuals. I'm I'm assuming who are engaged in in both the issues. What what are what are the motivations for new voters, first time younger voters, and what have you seen as most effective in terms of outreach to to this particular cohort? One well, thing I always try to remind myself of is not to underestimate the power of the basics. What do I mean by that? A lot of times, for example, on election protection, most of us are like, where is the most egregious case of intimidation? But sometimes benign neglect can be just as harmful. And that is people who don't know about the process. Uh, they don't get their voter registration card. They don't know where their polling location is because there's not enough information about that. Bringing it back to voter registration, um, I think studies have shown that for many Latinos, um, one thing is like not knowing about the process. So just like many of us uh, are, had been the first in our families to go to college, for example, many of us may also be the first in our immediate family to be a voter. And so when you think about it, in voting, of course, if you've done it and you've done it a couple of times, you know that it's not that complicated to be able to do it. But remember when you didn't know, right? And so particularly when you're young, uh, you don't, uh, frankly, it's anybody. We don't like to look like we don't know what we're doing. So the number of times that we've gone to a door to talk to a voter and they've said, Nobody's ever talked to me about this. Nobody's ever talked to me about participating. Uh, many young people said they don't know uh, where to go register or how, or, or how to sign up. And I know those things sound basic, but the good thing about that is that they're simple. So we can help with that. In addition to that, um, there's the other things, right? That people think, hey, millions among one in a million, uh, my vote doesn't does it's not going to make a difference. And of course, we all know that whether your vote is the tipping point or not, it absolutely makes a difference. Uh, so we talk to folks about bringing to the voting booth not only their aspirations, but their families and their communities, right? And that Rome wasn't built in one day. 
Now, more recently, we also have a ton of examples to show that a handful of folks can absolutely make the difference with their vote. So letting people know about that and connecting it to daily lives, right? When people focus on the presidential, a lot of times it's very hard to understand how that's going to have a direct impact on what you do. And that creates another opportunity to talk to people about why it's so important to not just vote for the presidential, but all the way down the ballot, because some of those positions at the county level, at the district level, they actually have a more direct impact on our daily lives. No, absolutely. And 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 again, I remember we used to say the the presidential elections maybe the ones that galvanize and capture our attention, but the ones that really matter, the bread and butter, the trash getting picked up, the street repairs, the quality of your schools, those are all local issues that um, creating that, um, just the, the tradition of voting is, is so important. But you know, Gladys, as I was thinking about what you're saying, um, the campaigns, my understanding, I've never worked on a, on a, on a campaign, but my understanding is that when they're thinking about the best use of resources, they will go for high propensity voters, which are voters who have voted, I don't know, over the last five elections, et cetera, and then work their way down. And when you have first time voters, like the ones that um, Unidos is targeting for registration, you're not contacted. And if you are contacted, it might be at the very end of a cycle. So um, is, if you were to give um, advice, to the campaigns, um, what would that be in a nutshell? Reach out, reach out early. Um, what are the things that you think make a difference from, from an actual campaign point of view? Yeah, I think that nutshell is candidates matter, their positions matter, and meaningful outreach is essential, right? Uh, amazingly enough, and we've asked this question, so we do pre-election polls and we also do another poll that is the equivalent of an exit poll uh, where we talk to Latinos who already voted early or by mail and those who are like 100% certain they're going to vote on election day, right? So it's on the eve, around the eve of the election. Among those folks, who are either like voters or highly, highly, highly likely to vote. For many cycles, what they have said, about 60% have said that nobody contacted them. That's an incredible number. And that's nationally, but the difference is not that significant, even when you look at that number in battleground states, right? So that to me just seems like outright political malpractice. What I was saying that things are looking slightly better is I was just looking at the, at the results of what we're gonna release next week. So I'll give you a sneak peek. And 55% uh, of respondents say that they haven't been reached out to yet. Uh, it's still August, it's 55%, which is less than 60, but it's it's an incredible number. And again, the level is not drastically different if you compare that national number to and break it down for Arizona or Nevada or Pennsylvania. And so I think partly it's because these voters by some have been seen as, I don't know if part of the base even does it justice, right? But it's like, okay, they are gonna vote for us no matter what, even though there's plenty of evidence to the contrary. But then what happens, and we've been challenging reporters about this too, is the times that you see a candidate who's lost an election, and this happens more on the Democratic side because that's where the, the, the expectation of support has been get bigger. And a lot of folks then turn around and blame Latino voters for not having done what they were supposed to do. But reporters don't necessarily ask those candidates. So how much, how often were you out there and talking to them? And if, you know, you that's a, a first rate question, I think. So that outreach is key. So between benign neglect and political malpractice, 
there, there's a lot of room for growth here, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Clarissa, I also wanted to ask you about um, what you call churn. And so in the last presidential election, there were um, stories written about how the Latino vote was becoming more Republican, more aligned with the Republican candidate, that they spoke to the issues um, in, a, in a way that resonated. I'm curious whether or not these are sort of nuanced differences, state by state, country of origin. Um, it, it clearly isn't a tsunami or, a, or, a, or a, a major shift. You've already told us that Latinos need to be spoken to, they need to be spoken about issues that they care about, the messengers need to be trusted, et cetera. But um, in, your, in your analysis, um, is there a trend towards alignment with the Republican Party? And if so, what is the strategies that have captured their vote? Yeah, so as a point of reference, the highest levels of support that the parties have achieved on the Republican side, the high water mark was George W. Bush, who was able to achieve 40% of the support of the Latino electorate the second time he ran. And he had a, a, a very strong mid-30s level of support the first time and then and then increased it. He's the high water mark there. Um, of course, he won his election on the re, on the on the Democratic side. Looking apples to apples polling, meaning I'm looking at comparisons of polling we've done across the year using similar methodology and polling teams. The high water mark it was Hillary Clinton uh, in terms of Latino support. Right now, she didn't win her election, but in terms of high water mark for Democrats about what's achievable, there's definitely her. So the reason I say alignment is to realignment is too strong a word is because what we've seen in the last couple of cycles is Republicans regaining some of the ground they had lost. So they started underperforming their traditional 30% level of support in the last decade. In the last couple of cycles, they've recouped that one third and have increased it by a couple of points. And it's not just, um, I mean, I, I know everybody likes to talk about Cubans, right? And it is absolutely true that with Cubans, that level of support is a lot higher, but they have actually increased their levels of support by a couple, if not a few more than a couple percentage points across the board. Right. So that they could be between in between 30 to 37, depending on the state. So there has been an improvement there. Um, but if you are going up a couple points or from what has been the norm, that doesn't tell me it's a realignment just yet. But there is opportunity. Again, I mentioned many Latinos see themselves as conservative. Um so there's an opportunity there for Republicans to increase support. Like there is an opportunity for Democrats to solidify and build on the two thirds that has been traditional for them. So in terms of what's appealing, I would, you know, we talked about how top issues for Latinos tend to be economic issues, pocketbook, right? Wages, better jobs, housing, how the economy is doing. Right now, cost of living and inflation are dominant. And whether one likes it or not, I think that Republicans have been very successful at building a perception that if you care about the economy, Republicans are better on the economy. So they have that wind in their sales going on right now that three of the top five issues for Latino voters are actually economic related issues, right? Now, one of the interesting things is that, um, you know, maybe it's because it, it, she's new, it's the honeymoon period, but Harris's uh, points on the scoreboard on the, on the economy seem to be better than they were for Biden, right? And so we'll see how that goes. But I think the economy is some, a win in, in the sales for Republicans. 
I think that for Democrats, there's a couple of opportunities, some of them not fully capitalized on with these voters. They have to talk about the economy, no doubt. But Latinos also deeply care about health care, about gun violence, about uh, the concerns about women's health as a result of abortion, and of course, on immigration. Well, I know we've got questions from, from the audience, so I'm going to turn to them, but um, I do want to come back both to immigration and how the candidates should talk about that, and then we can't close this out without talking about um, what we just witnessed at both conventions and what you see is this next phase, you know, typically they say that, you know, you actually get into sort of the, the that last push following Labor Day um, and what makes you hopeful in terms of a better understanding of a Latino vote, better, um, more effective outreach and, um, you know, your your expectations um, for voter registration between now and, and the end of the year, but I mean, the, um, to, the, to the election cycle. So Lorian, why don't I turn to you? And then if we do have time, we'll talk about both immigration and then um, this last phase. Okay, great. There are two questions that have come in. Uh, the first relates to our colleagues up at Antioch Santa Barbara. Um, and this Monica, you mentioned making informed decisions. Um, Antioch Santa Barbara coupled with Santa Barbara Community College together, they're holding a forum in Santa Barbara in October. Uh, with the aim of make, helping people make informed decisions. What do either of you think are some of the effective ways to do this? And let me underscore that this is really a form about more local issues than national. Well, before, you know, it, as a way of answering that, first, let me just thank um, Antioch Santa Barbara for hosting the forum. And Clarissa, you had mentioned earlier about Latinos being targeted with misinformation. And one of the things that the three of us know is that we live in a moment when sort of traditional media and the media models are under great stress. Um, and we're seeing, you know, smaller and smaller newsrooms, we're seeing um, news organizations that are shuttering um, and the traditional sources of, of news and information that would help individuals make informed decisions are, are, are more limited than what they had been. And as a result of that, um, we also see that Latinos are targeted now for um, misinformation, primarily through social media channels. And because these are not curated, because they haven't been um, expressly, you know, fact-checked, um, it, it becomes one of these things that, you know, we all need to be um, on the lookout for and, and think about ways in which we can combat disinformation. And I know that Unidos, you might even want to talk about this, but if we have time, but there is a coalition of organizations like Unidos and others um, that are doing work to, to combat misinformation and to, to help folks um, understand how to sort of um, navigate through all of those sources. Um, Latinos over index on um, WhatsApp, on YouTube, those are the two primary sources of information where it used to be Spanish language media and others. So, you know, just putting that aside, um, we, we have a, a real challenge on our side. So in terms of um, making informed decisions, I think what we're finding is that philanthropy is stepping up. They understand that democracy is under siege, that people don't have traditional sources of information. They're supporting voter guides, voter outreach, voter information in ways that we hadn't seen before. Um, we need to support organizations like Unidos US and others that have credibility um, and whose, um, whose brand resonates with our community. So I would say um, continue to do what you're doing, which is, you know, we need trusted messengers. Educators are probably among the top in terms of trusted messengers. Um, and so bringing that information to life through things like voter forums, voter guides, connecting with your, your local philanthropic partners that are willing to invest um, in, in this kind of outreach and, and, and your nonprofit partners as well, which are, are the ones on the ground doing this door knocking um, every single day. Marisa, what would you add? I'm not sure what kind of forum it is. In other words, if it's for, stu for the student community, for the community or others, but Particularly in California, where the the vote the 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 ballot uh, could be 
incredibly long because of valid initiatives and other things. Um, but there's also vote by mail. And I mean, it's an, incre it's an incredibly voter friendly state compared to so many others. But one thing that has worked for folks is, you know, particularly with new voters, is inviting people to bring their ballot and just walking through it so people can understand it. As you all know, sometimes ballot initiative, I mean, people get paid to write ballot initiatives in ways that will confuse people, right? It's like, okay, when I say no, is that yes? Or when I say yes, is that no? Right? And so... um, that walking through that would be very important. Um, we, you know, I don't think that California has one of these, but I, we do have information on basically support for ballot initiatives about wages, minimum wage are overwhelmingly supported by Latinos. I think that right now there's a number of states with ballot initiatives on abortion access. I think California may be one of them. There's strong support from Latinos there. Um, how one talks about it is important, right? So again, I'll just mention this because I'll, I'll give you that example. When we unveiled the results of our previous poll, um, which by the way, is consistent with the new one coming up next week, that 72% of Latinos said, Regardless of my personal beliefs, I don't think abortion should be illegal. Many people turned around and immediately said, Latinos are pro-choice. And, you know, and, I, and, and my caution is, if you go talk to the community and you say, well, you're pro-choice, blah, 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 blah. People, you're going to wedge people right there. So it's more important to talk about what it is, what rights are maybe taken away or not for people to understand that and not try to cleave them on the extremes. But anyway, th that's a great opportunity in California. Invite folks to bring their ballot and walk through it. Thank it's you. A, that, that makes it a, a, a three hour forum because our ballots tend to be <laughs> encyclopedias. We've got uh, two other questions. So let's see if we can get to both of them. This is an interesting asking for your reflection. Can the opportunity be made available for Latino US residents, not US citizens, the access to vote for local or state elections as taxpayers and members of the community? Their voices should count. Does my question make sense? And what is your thought about that? There are actually locations that allow residents of the jurisdiction to be able to vote, right? Um, in some school board elections, in some places, uh, maybe even a little bit more than that. So I think that that has to be put up to, you know, for local folks to advocate for those and be able to put them forth. But there are there are locations where um, residents are able to vote in very local type of offices. Yeah, just uh, just to uh, put an exclamation point on that, I completely agree with the sentiment that it, particularly in certain local elections like school boards, and if you look at California where 70% of public school um, age students are Latino. It's an, and if their parents are not necessarily citizens, are not able to vote in school board elections. So here's the group that most requires representation and, and is excluded. So I do believe that especially in, in races like school boards, um, it's important to be um, more, more accessible um, regardless of citizenship. Thank you. Okay, we'll take this one last question and then turn it back over to you guys to uh, close it out. Here's the question. Trump is appealing to the male bl and black male vote. How is the machismo strategy, how will it work for the GOP in terms of getting new support from male Latino voters? This is one of the reasons, you know, the, the notions about Latino machismo is one of the reasons when Republicans started regaining some of the ground they had lost, that depending on who you were talking to, folks immediately pointed the finger at older Latino men, right? And, and that it had to do with machismo 
or it had to do with racism or a number of other things like that. So I'm not saying that there aren't any Latinos for whom those things might have been true, but I think that the that that the reality is a little more complex than that. Um, as we mentioned, economic issues are top of mind, and I think that uh, there is a very strong sense that re sense that Republicans are better on economic issues. And frankly, the what people have to go on as a measure is how was their wallet doing, right? How is it doing now? How was it doing then? You may or may not like that, right? But for many Americans, for many voters, that's how you gauge, right? Who you ascribe that economic situation to. So that to me is one of the big ones. In addition to that, I think that we had seen the concerns. Um, I think that there's definitely a global trend towards strong men because they all seem to be men, right? In authoritarianism and Trump very much fits that mold. So there's that. But the last thing I would say there is to remember that slide we showed where among newer voters is where the biggest churn is. And that's where the answer can get even more complex, right? Those folks are forming their opinions about the parties. And so again, exclamation point, Outreach and introducing people to voters is key. Thank you. Okay, so, Mona. Yeah, glad you said, um, I, we only have five more minutes, so I want to ask you where you want to end, but I did have the, the two things. So <laughs> you, Monica. You know, say, <laughs> so when you think about it, immigration is a huge, complex topic, right? So you hear everything from border security, build the wall, to um, comprehensive immigration reform and a path to citizenship. What what is the right way to signal a, a candidate's position on immigration that would resonate with Latino voters? One interesting thing is that just the same way that Latinos, uh, people want to try to put us in an either or kind of box. I think the same happens with immigration. People are like you Latinos are either for a path to citizenship or for border security, which is bonkers. Because for the for the immigration system to work, all of those things work in tandem. And the poll that we did that was solely on immigration and the views of Latino voters, I think re really show that Latino voters see these things are intertwined. You cannot restore the rule of law by doing only enforcement or border and ignoring the legality of people who have lived here for decades. You cannot preserve the rule of law if you don't have a working legal immigration system that incentivizes people to come with a visa rather than a smuggler. And so the results of that poll show that. I think that candidate Biden um, was vulnerable on that issue and, and, and made themselves weaker by kind of not talking about it. So in some ways we've been saying, hey, you gotta talk about this and in some ways, Democrats have an opportunity based on what voters are saying. And we're kind of seeing uh, Harris do that. The reality is that Latinos wanna see a secure border and also protection for the long residing undocumented and a functioning asylum system. And those things are not mutually exclusive. They're actually sides of the same coin. Well, you don't get to ask me a question because you are the one who works for a nonprofit organization who is doing voter outreach, voter registration. How do we support your work, Larissa? Um, and, and what is your vision between now and election day in terms of getting that closing that opportunity gap for those who are eligible but not registered? Well, I do hope that folks uh, like Ryan uh, organize different activities to try to demystify the voting process, right? Uh, the voting process can be intimidated. I'm saying that as a naturalized citizen who learned um, about it later on. I already knew English very well. And I can tell you that I still kind of fell on sick, uh, you know, I'm sure on my feet the first time I went because I hadn't done it before, right? And so just socializing those things and that, they're easy, they're, they're, they're simple, not easy, right? It's an important decision. 
uh, doing things like helping someone uh, who hasn't registered to register to vote, particularly now that we can all be ambassadors to voter registration by having on our phone uh, a link to, to different sites. Those kinds of things, I think that serving as a poll worker, particularly during this time, one of the ways that we prevent um, the election system from becoming intimidating is by making sure that polling locations look like the neighborhoods that people that people live in the neighborhood. And so serving as a poll worker and being welcoming of voters coming to the polls is really important. For folks who are inclined, you can certainly donate to Unidos, um, but look at our data, challenge misconceptions about this, uh, th this electorate and any other voter. I think that one of the things that we all have a huge role to play in, and I was gonna ask Monica about that, but is challenging this environment of division because I do honestly feel that we are less divided than what we are surrounded by. There is a pull to try to tear us to a corner or to an extreme, but that's not where we naturally live. So let's figure out how to protect that space that allows us to come together. And frankly, may sound tried, but indeed to protect our democracy. I really appreciate that. And, and I appreciate everybody's time and interest and Lorian and, and to you, Chancellor Groves. Um, you started off this discussion by talking about education and action. Um, and Clarissa just gave us some very solid advice on get ready, get set, go vote, um, and, and things that we can do to help others get engaged and understand the electoral process. So thank you all, that was great. Mm -hmm.